Very good afternoon to all. We will begin shortly. Uh, before I start, uh, can I reconfirm if Dr. Algaya already online? I know you're online. Uh, yes, yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay, you're already set. Um, we have Dr. Watson already online and Dr. Kristen yeah. is also online. Okay, I think we can we can begin. Good afternoon to all and thank you for being here today. Uh, um, I hope you are safe at home and despite all the chaos that is happening across the globe and including here in the Bahamas, so I hope you stay safe, follow your uh, the order by the government, stay safe within your unit and um, ensure you keep to the social distance and keep your hands always clean. So please uh, follow the orders because we have to help ourselves before if we want to help this world as we progress. So today uh, in our session, we have an interesting presentation. Uh, today's presentation is under the Small Island Sustainability Research Program. It's hosted by the Office of Graduate Studies and Research. And uh, we have a presentation from Dr. from Dr. Jacob uh, Algaier from the University of Michigan, USA. So before I hand over the session, um, there's just a few housekeeping that I need to announce. Um, please be informed that this session is will be recorded. Okay, so whatever that is being presented, whatever that is being uh, asked and, and discussed will be recorded. All your microphone will be muted because we have quite a number of people that is uh, that have uh, that is going to be dialing in. At the end of the presentation, you can raise your question by using the raise hand option that you see uh, just next to your the participant uh, uh, option there, and we will unmute you when you need to ask any question. At the same time, you are free to ask your question in the chat box as well. So the moderator will look at the chat box and raise the question uh, if uh, the presenter did not see the question. So that is how we're going to manage this session. So I hope that is okay with uh, all of you out there. Uh, so without further ado, let me first uh, call Doc, the Dean of the Pure and Applied Sciences, uh, Dr. Carlton Watson, to say a few words before we hand over the session uh, to Dr. Christian Unwala, who will moderate the session. Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Good morning all and um, welcome on behalf of the Faculty of Pure Applied Sciences as well as the Small Island Sustainability Program and Research Complex. I want to welcome all of you to this special presentation. I'm very thankful for to um, Jake for um, agreeing to present under this format. We had originally uh, intend for him to be in Nassau, but we all understand the conditions that we are working in. I just want to say something quickly about the Small Island Sustainability and also to thank um, Diane Claridge who introduced me to, uh, to Stephanie Archer who introduced me to Jake. Um, so it is through those connections that we were able to, to discuss collaborations with a view of moving um, our small island sustainability program forward in the country, particularly in the area of marine science and fisheries. And this presentation really fits in well with the objective of our small island sustainability program at the university, which is to strengthen sustainable livelihoods in the marine sciences by looking at sustainable and conservation uh, methods. So I wanna thank you all, um, this is not this is um, not going to be the last um, presentation that we, uh, this is unlikely to be the last presentation in this format. So I'll, I'll ask that you continue to look out for future presentations. But thanks again um, for all of you who are here. And I will turn it over to Kristen Anwala, who manages um, and coordinates the Small Island uh, Sustainability Program at the University of the Bahamas. Thank you, Dr. Watson. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today and want to thank you all for joining us remotely during these unusual and challenging times. But I welcome the chance to spend this hour today with Dr. Algeyer and all of you in discussing ecology. Dr. Jacob Algeyer is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. He received his PhD from University of Georgia in 2013. Jake is an ecologist with broad interests in how human-induced changes alter how ecosystems function and the services that they provide. His work is rooted in basic ecological theory, but motivated by increasing need for food security, particularly in coastal societies. His research seeks to identify the mechanisms by which behavioral population and community dynamics mediate nutrient and energy pathways. The objective of his research is to improve the ability to predict ecological outcomes and enhance conservation efficacy, such as the sustainability of ecosystem services like fisheries. I'm very excited about this talk. I think this might actually be the first scientific talk I've heard specifically on fish pee. So without further ado, I'll pass off the video to Dr. Jake Algeyer and let him give his talk entitled Farming the Coastal Oceans with Fish Pea, Applying Ecological Theory to Help Sustain Fisheries in Tropical Coastal Ecosystems. All right, thank you very much. Uh, can, can someone confirm that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, great. Yes. Cool, well, thanks a lot. Yeah, so thanks a lot for having me. It's, um, it's obviously a disappointment to, to not be there in person. Um, this was supposed to be for me a, a kickoff for a, a small short trip where I was gonna head over to Eleuthera um, to meet up with Nick Higgs and try to look for some sites for some of the projects that I'll actually be talking about today. But, you know, we, we've all got to make it through the situation, so we'll do our best. And I'm certainly can, uh, positive that I will, be, I will be on land at some point in the near future, um, to say the least. So, um, so yeah, the, the goal, um, well, so basically the goal of, today is, of, this speak, of this talk today is to give you all sort of an overview of one aspect of my research, and that's largely thinking about um, artificial reef research and how we can use them as really useful experimental units in ecology, but then also how they may be used as a tool for conservation. And I'm really excited about talking with this group in particular because I've been working uh, in the Bahamas for about 15 years now. And the last uh, maybe six years, I've been more focused in, our research has been more, a little bit more focused in Haiti. And as uh, Kristen mentioned, I'm now an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. And I'm starting to get my lab sort of up and running. And I've got a really great group of students working with, with me. And so I'm really excited about sort of re-energizing the research that we've been doing in the Bahamas. And in doing so, I'd really like to build a lot of collaborations with sort of local researchers, students, and then also importantly, community members in, in the Bahamas, both in Abaco, where I've been working for years, but also in Eleuthera, and then in particular with respect to uh, working with UB. So it's, been, it's great uh, interacting with Kristen and Carlton so far, and obviously we, I hope to carry that forward. So, let's see, all right. So there's roughly 2.5 billion people that live within 100 kilometers of the coastline throughout the world. Most of these people live in tropical regions, and most of these people are living in impoverished conditions. And these numbers are only expected to grow. So by 2050, they expect to have, they're ex expected to have roughly 5 billion people living along the coastline. And with this increase in population density, it's increasingly important for us to try to understand how we can better manage these ecosystems, both for the health of the systems themselves, but also for the services they provide for society. I like to start a lot of talks out with this map because it shows where in the global oceans humans are having the largest impact. And it's just simply a heat map. And so you can see that the areas in red are areas that they've, the researchers have highlighted that humans are having the largest impact. And it, it's pretty obvious that we're having the most impact along the coastal areas because that's where we are in fact interacting with, where humans are in fact interacting with the oceans at the highest degree. But importantly, I'd like to highlight that they, they highlight the Caribbean as being one of the regions that are among the most threatened by these human uh, ocean interactions. And in particular, there's three main stressors by which humans are affecting these coastal ecosystems. Nutrient pollution and overfishing, which are two stressors that I've focused a lot of my research on in the last decade or so, and then climate change, which we're seeing increasingly 
uh, evident uh, over the last decade or so in uh, in these regions, and it's and that's also an area where we're starting to ramp up our research as well. And we can see clearly the implications of these effects. So this is a, I like to show this figure. Um, this is an image of an acropora reef, a healthy acropora reef uh, in Abaco. This is actually the Pelican Keys Land and Sea Park. And then similarly, another image of the same type of reef that we see that's highly degraded in Haiti. These little nubbins you see are actually dead acropora. And so coral reefs, seagrass beds, and mangroves are really essential for the food security for millions of people, but they're also, among, uh, also globally among the most in our ecosystems. And so trying to understand how we can better manage these systems is critical for the sustainability of both humanity, but as well as these ecosystems. And so a fundamental question of my research is what mechanisms can be put in place to promote uh, sustainable food security for coastal societies. And again, I stress the word sustainable because I think it's critical that we appreciate the fact that we need to manage and maintain the health and biodiversity of these amazing ecosystems. But we also need to try to understand how we can still use those to extract and utilize the, the vital services that they provide society. So the notion of food security uh, has been really critical for humanity for centuries. And we've been thinking about it, particularly in terms of the yield that, that ecosystems can provide for humanity. And the agricultural revolution was a really excellent case in point when we as a society, as a global society, took advantage of the scientific advances that we had to actually increase the productivity of lands. And the way we did this was by understanding the fact that nutrients are limiting production in terrestrial ecosystems. And through the application of nutrients uh, as fertilizer, we can enhance drastically the amount of, of productivity that the lands can harvest and then create uh, better yields for society. This excess, over time, we've been using increasingly more nutrients, and these excess nutrients come at, a, at, a, at an important cost. And so this image shows the Mississippi Delta, where the nutrients running out of the central part of the United States are entering the Gulf of Mexico. And these plumes you see here, they look, they look pretty. They're, they're actually algal plumes. And those uh, can ultimately lead to dead zones, which are degrading these coastal ecosystems. And that, that degradation that's associated with all the increased production we're getting from the terrestrial, the terrestrial um, component of the, of the land is having negative repercussions on the services that these coastal ecosystems are providing humanity. And so the goal would be to try to figure out how we can actually enhance the productivity of these ecosystems without having these negative feedbacks uh, associated with things like in intensive agriculture. One thing I should mention is a lot of these images and videos uh, are taken by Matt McCoy, who's, um, who's a, a colleague of mine, and he and I have been working on some filming projects in Haiti and the Bahamas, so he, he definitely deserves credit, and this is one of them. So coral reefs, seagrass beds, and mangroves are among the most productive ecosystems on the planet. But one thing that's notable is that they're also, they also exist in some of the most nutrient-poor environments. And you can tell they're nutrient-poor by simply looking at how clear the water column is. If there was a lot of available nutrients, the water would be more green because that would be, these nutrients would be enhancing phytoplankton production. And this we call uh, the Darwin's paradox because Darwin noticed when he was on the Beagle in the, uh, uh, in the mid 1800s that these ecosystems appeared so highly productive, but you could see, see through the water. So that meant that they were nutrient limited. So trying to understand what are the drivers of their productivity in these tropical coastal ecosystems is a really fundamental question in particularly coral reef science, but also in my research program. And then further trying to understand how we can actually leverage this knowledge to improve conservation efforts is a real motivating factor in my research. How can we take the, the understanding of what are the things that are really underpinning productivity in these systems and then use that in our advantage, particularly in sustainable way. And based on the title of my talk, you may, may have guessed where this might be going. Well, I think that, that taking advantage and harnessing the potential of fish 
CMP or consumer media, media nutrient dynamics may be a critical step forward in how we think about conservation in these ecosystems. So this is by no means a novel thought. This is something that people have been thinking about for quite some time. And, and in particular, Judy Meyer in, in the early 80s um, published a paper in Science showing that, that fish aggregating around uh, coral heads actually increased the productivity of the coral um, by, by upwards of, of 70%. And so basically what she noticed, she was actually, so Judy Meyer was a uh, professor at the University of Georgia where I did my PhD. And so this was really inspirational work for me, um, having met her right when I showed up to, to, to the University of Georgia. And what Judy had noticed when she was actually on vacation was that, the, that certain coral head tend to have more fish aggregating around them than others. And so through, through a series of experiments and exclusions, she, she quantified the extent to which the aggregating fish actually influenced the productivity of that, of that coral. And she showed that the mechanism was that the fish are excreting these nutrients, largely in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, that's in turn fertilizing the local environment that in turn enhances the productivity of the coral that they're excreting these nutrients around. And so what's really important about this is that this creates this feedback dynamic whereby the fish through excreting these nutrients are actually improving the habitat that they live on. And that in turn feeds back on them in positive ways. It makes, them, makes their habitat better for them and then they feed back on that. And so this, this, got, um, this got me thinking, so is there a way that we can actually try to initiate these same feedback dynamics by using artificial reefs? So in, in this, in contrast to thinking about it directly on a coral reef, um, colleagues and I, this, so a lot of this earlier work was um, conducted with Craig Lehman, so I should give, give Craig a shout out for that at this point. But we started thinking, well, maybe we can actually see this process in seagrass beds. So sort of simulating the way that we're doing, um, we're adding fertilizer to agricultural fields. If we can seed this process in seagrass, we can enhance the production locally around these artificial reefs. And so we, worked, we, we sort of set up a hypothesis that we have, have since been testing. And the idea is simply that we could put some sort of structure in the open seagrass bed. The structure then would attract fishes that would aggregate around this structure. They would in turn recycle nutrients back to the local environment, again, focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus as the key main nutrients that we're interested in. These nutrients would fertilize the local habitat, which would increase the primary production around the artificial reef, which would in turn provide more habitat and food resources for invertebrates, which in turn could feed back on the fish population in a positive way and actually enhance the fish productivity as well. So again, it's thinking about this positive feedback associated with this cycle, but it all really begins with the aggregating fish and then fertilizing this, the area uh, with their nutrients. So what I'm gonna do for this talk is I'm gonna kind of walk you all through sort of just a series of the, the studies that we've conducted to essentially test this hypothesis. And after I kind of provide some evidence that supports the fact that, that this feedback cycle does exist, then I'm gonna talk about how we're trying to move forward with some of those ideas to think about how they may be better applied or how we can, how we can apply them in, in effective ways towards restoration of these coastal ecosystems. So the first step of all this was to actually quantify the, the amount of nutrients that fish are supplying back to these ecosystems. And so basically this took, this was a, a I guess a substantial proportion of my PhD work. It took me about four years to do this. And the idea was relatively simple. We just needed to collect the fish, you put it in a bag, you measure the nutrients in the bag before and after the fish has been been there, so obviously a bag of water, you don't want to not have the fish in the water, uh, measure the nutrients in the, in the water before and after the fish, and the difference tells you how much they're supplying to the local environment. And so using these methodologies, methodologies I, I quantified the excretion rates from uh, some, some 70 species of fish, a bunch of species of invertebrates, thousands of individuals, and importantly, we measured both excretion 
and the storage of the nutrients in their tissue. I'm not going to focus uh, really at all this talk on anything about the storage, but uh, more so on the excretion part. And so, and so with that information, we can basically go to any coastal ecosystem in the Caribbean. And we've, we've in fact actually done this as well in the, in the Pacific. So we can go to any really coral reef, tropical coastal ecosystem throughout the world and given knowledge of what species are there and the number of those individuals and their relative body size, we can then estimate the amount of nutrients that the entire community is actually storing in the tissue of that community. And then also the amount of nutrients that are feeding back to the local environment. And so another important part of this is trying to not only understand how much nutrients they're supplying, but also what are the effects of these nutrients for primary producers and coral within these ecosystems. Using that conceptual framework, we can also think about how humans are affecting these ecosystems, particularly through processes like overfishing. So as we fish, we remove certain species from the community and that in turn changes the structure of the community and changes how the community can both store these nutrients, but also how that community can supply these nutrients back to the environment. So within all this, the first real way to understand how much fish, fish pee mattered in these local ecosystem processes was, was to go out and test it. So we set up, uh, this was I guess in 2000, 2009, um, we set up a series of artificial reef experiments. This is the first set of experiments uh, throughout the Bight of Old Robinson uh, on Abaco. And the idea was just to, to use basic cinder block and um, make reefs of different sizes, which would change the, the number of fish and the biomass of fish on these different reefs. And then we could measure the processes uh, in the seagrass around it. Specifically trying to understand how that affects the production, the productivity of the seagrass around these reefs. And what I want to highlight here is this is a sort of a kind of in hindsight, it looks a little, a little dinky relative to the reefs we've built lately. We didn't use any glue or anything, but it doesn't take much for fish to really aggregate around these reefs and high numbers of, of species, but also quite a bit of biomass. And so the finding from this, from this initial study was very straightforward. So we were able to quantify, given those, those empirical measures of excretion that I, that I told you about earlier, we were able to quantify the amount of nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus that each community of fish on a given artificial reef supplied, and then compare that to how that affected the growth rate or the productivity of the seagrass around those reefs. So each data point here indicates the amount of nitrogen supplied or phosphorus supplied on a given reef. And you can see that there's just a really strong positive relationship, basically saying simply that where you have more fish, you have more nutrients, where you have more nutrients, uh, that's fertilizing the local seagrass and you get enhanced seagrass productivity. And this is an image from uh, a reef that's been in the Bight of Old Robinson now for, uh, I guess about five years. And you can see the sort of halo uh, of seagrass around this reef and how much, how dense it is relative to sort of the open seagrass out here. Right? Obviously it's not the best photo, but I think it does a pretty good job of highlighting the, the extent to which this productivity happens around a given reef. And so, so since this study, we've, we've done some follow-up work where we actually identified the mechanism by which um, seagrass enhances locally around the reef. And we've since generated a, a mathematical model that has actually shown that even if fish are just attracting to the reef from nearby seagrass, that you're actually not losing productivity from that open seagrass. And in fact, you're enhancing through a synergistic uh, interaction when you have the, the aggregation of all the nutrients around the reef that triggers a response in the seagrass that really enhances the, the seagrass production. So in fact, by fish aggregating around the reef, we're not losing production anywhere, but we're instead gaining production around the reef. We've also done some follow-up studies showing that, that this production in the seagrass does in fact enhance the productivity of the invertebrates in the seagrass. And that's um, some work that, that my lab is gonna to continue to work on trying to understand to what extent secondary production in, in the invertebrates is being enhanced. 
And then a continued part of the work that we're still trying to, trying to nail down exactly is trying to quantify how this in turn cascades up into the fish community and how, to what extent does this affect fish productivity. But while this shows that more fish equals more production, it also suggests that when there's fewer fish, you have smaller amounts of production. And so that leads to a question, well, in that case, how does the removal of fish, in the case when we were actually fishing and reducing the biomass of these communities, how does that in turn affect these nutrient dynamics? And so to address this question, I got together with some colleagues that they conducted a really uh, elegant series of surveys throughout the entire Caribbean. And importantly, they, they did these surveys on um, half of the reefs that they worked on were, um, were in marine protected areas and not fished, and then half of them were actively fished. And so what they simply did was they went to these coral reefs and they quantified what species were there and what, how many of each of those individuals were and what their relative sizes were. And with that information, we could then again quantify how much nutrients are being stored in each of those communities and then how much nutrients are in turn being fed back to the local environment. And as just a sort of an aside, using this type of data, we were also able to quantify the extent to which fish can supply nutrients uh, within these systems and actually compare it to other sources. And we found that fish are far and away among the largest sources of nutrients. They provide the largest source of nutrients to coral reefs. And in fact, we showed that, or we found that, um, increased fishing does reduce the amount of nutrients supplied by these communities. It's a relatively logical finding. And here we see on the, on the x-axis that the population density of humans is correlated negatively with the amount of nutrients being supplied by a given, by a given uh, fish community on a coral reef. And this is, so this is more clearly shown when we simply look at the reefs that are versus fish versus not fish. And you can see that fishing alone reduces the amount of nutrient supply by almost half. It's about 41 or 42%. And so this has potentially really important repercussions to the local ecosystem, because again, if fish are a critical source of nutrients that are fertilizing these systems, and all of a sudden we reduce the supply of that nutrient in these, again, nutrient limited systems, that's gonna have repercussions for the, the net productivity, which again, feeds back on, potentially feeds back on the fish productivity. So we've shown that human population through the mechanism of fishing can drastically reduce the amount of fish mediated nutrients. But, but we also know that where, where you have humans, you also have human mediated nutrients, largely in the form of sewage. And, um, and so that sort of begets the question, well, can these nutrients provided by humans actually replace the nutrients lost when we fish these fish out of these, out of these ecosystems? And this is a really important and good question. And in fact, I was first asked this question by um, local fishers in the Bahamas when I was giving uh, a talk to, I believe it was in Sandy Point. And sort of it, it, or I, um, it shows that these local fishers really understand these ecosystems and are really thoughtful about the dynamics in the systems. And at first, I, I, didn't have a good, I didn't have a good answer for them. I didn't really know why those nutrients may or may not be different. And in fact, maybe anthropogenic nutrients could supplant the loss of these fish mediated nutrients. But after thinking about it in some time, I realized that the ratio of the two sources should be quite different. And so when I say the ratio, I'm talking about the amount of nitrogen relative to the amount of phosphorus. And we, we know from previous work that, the, that fish communities tend to supply nutrients with relatively large amounts of nitrogen relative to phosphorus. And then we know that, that human sewage is very rich in phosphorus. And the reason why these nutrients, these ratios are actually important is because we also know that, that producers have an optimal requirement of nutrients that, that, that can maximize productivity. So if you think about having a personal garden, and you want to grow some tomatoes, you can go to the store and because we've, we've studied efficiently, the science knows um, how tomatoes grow optimally. We'll know, we know the exact ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus 
of the fertilizer that you should add to optimize or maximize the growth of those tomatoes. And so that could be really important if we're changing the ratio of the nutrient input to these ecosystems. It could fundamentally alter how things grow within these systems. But at this point, we actually didn't know what coral reef fish communities were supplying to the local environment. And so I got together with some other colleagues who had conducted a survey throughout the Northern Antilles. And the, importantly, they, they conducted surveys on coral reefs, seagrass beds, and mangroves, but they did so in many of these regions throughout the Bahamas that are relatively healthy. So these fish communities weren't heavily impacted by fishing pressure. And then we, what we could do is we could use that information to ask what was the ratio of the, of the nutrients being supplied by these communities. So I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this, but I think that the point that, that we, we found here is actually really interesting and useful for, oops, sorry about that, useful for understanding um, the importance of these fish-mediated nutrients for these ecosystems. Okay, so what I've got here is just a, um, a simple line plot where we have on the left, it shows ratios with more phosphorus, and on the right, it shows ratios with more, with more nitrogen. And when I plot the, 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 the four different coral reef types that we measured the fish community uh, supply ratio on, you see that they supplied nutrients within a relatively narrow range of ratios, right? So it's suggesting that despite being quite different, these fish community tended to supply these nutrients back at a pretty narrow band. And, and this, this band was so narrow and there was so little variation that it, it got me thinking, well, what does that possibly mean for coral? And so I did a little study uh, where I compiled the, um, all the data from the literature where scientists had manipulated the nutrient environment for coral. And then when, what they did was they would, they would change the nutrient environment for coral, and then they would measure how the coral did under these different nutrient conditions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot those, those findings on this, on this plot. So what we found was that in all cases in which the ratio of the, of the um, nutrient environment that, that the coral were experimentally um, sub, uh, subjected to, if it was less than 10 to 1 or greater than 30 to 1, in all cases, the coral died. However, when, when the environment was manipulated by ratios that was bracketed between 10 and 30 to 1, the coral always survived. And what you notice is that's, that's exactly the ratio at which the fish community are supplying these nutrients. So again, think about it. That's basically saying that kind of in relation to your home garden, that's basically supplying, saying that these fish are supplying the exact optimal ratio that is perfect for coral growth, right? And that again gets back into that feedback dynamic that I talked about where the, where the fish are actually enhancing the, uh, the quality of the habitat that in turn feeds back positively on, on sort of their life history. So I think this is a, it was a really compelling finding and it's something that, that really got me excited. But again, these are sort of just correlative findings. We can't say anything mechanistic about this, right? And so I, I was interested in trying to pursue this question a little bit further in a little bit more of a mechanistic way. And that again is, a, is where these artificial reefs become really useful because we can use them as experimental units and essentially we can create our own little ecosystem around one of these artificial reefs. And so what we did was we manipulated these reefs to have fish only, which would have these sort of high nitrogen relative to phosphorus um, sort of uh, nutrient inputs to the local ecosystem. And then we also uh, manipulated them to have a fertilizer effect. So we actually use these diffusers that we that we re, um, replaced over the, I guess this study was uh, three years, but we've actually been doing this now continually for, um, it's 2011 is when we first started this study. So we've been manipulating this environment with these nutrients that creates a, a very low ratio that simulates uh, human sewage. And then we could ask questions about, well, how did that affect the surrounding seagrass? But then also we ask questions about how does that, what does that mean for coral? And you can see that there's, on this tree, we have coral suspended. I'm not sure how clear your video is, but we have coral suspended on this that we could then in turn measure how these nutrients affected that coral. 
And so before I, I go to the next slide, I want to point out that you can just see here in this image the, the different, there's actually a different species of seagrass on, on this reef than there is on this reef. This is Thalassia testidum, and this is Syringodium. This is the sort of common turtle grass. And what happened is that due to this change in ratio, we saw a complete shift in the community of the seagrass around the reef. And so the addition of this sewage-like fertilizer changed the composition of the seagrass, but we don't actually still know what that means for the invertebrate community or in turn the fish community. So we don't know how that might change the energy flow moving up the food web. But it's a really clear shift towards this different um, seagrass community because the optimal conditions for that seagrass community are better met by the ratio supplied by this fertilizer. So with respect to the coral, these findings, uh, they're a little more nuanced, but they're, they're really interesting. And I, I won't spend too much time on this, but in order to understand it, you first have to, to know that coral, in order for coral to survive, they have what's called a zooxanthellae algae that lives within the side of its tissue. So coral are essentially, um, they're related to jellyfish, they're clear. And the thing that gives them the color is the algae that lives within its side of its tissue. And you can see, here, these little, these little um, nodules, that's actually the algae inside the tissue. And so in order for a coral to survive, they have to have this really intricate relationship with the algae. And that relation, relationship is dynamic and it's really complicated. And so what we found was that when we enriched the coral with nutrients, they still grew, but it actually fundamentally changed how the coral interacted with that algae. And so we called it, we, we termed it rewiring the coral. Basically what we saw was that the algae in essence took over all of the interactions. So you can imagine this is a, a coral uh, under the conditions of fish only. The coral grew really well. And you can see these, these arrows, you don't have to really focus on the details of them, but the fact that they're interacting and they're diverse is really important. And it's showing that coral is really healthy. Well, then you can see that these pathways are very different and that everything runs through this, this box here, which is the algal pathway. And so what it's saying is the algae are actually taking over the coral, which in turn means that the coral might be susceptible to any further stressors. So maybe changes in temperature could lead to uh, bleaching events or further stress to the coral that could ultimately kill it. So it's a really subtle finding that we, that we had, but basically we think what it is is a transition point where the coral is becoming more susceptible to further stressors. It's a pretty cool finding and uh, that paper's uh, still in revision. Okay, so um, that was kind of a run through of some of the, the ways that we've been trying to understand and test this hypothesis about these feedback dynamics around, around artificial reefs and associated with um, the importance of fish nutrient supply for these coastal ecosystems. So what have we learned and, and where are we going is sort of where I'm going to take this next. And essentially, we've learned that fish are really critical for fueling these high rates of productivity in tropical coastal ecosystems. They're among the largest source of nutrients and that it's, really, it's a really important source of nutrients that needs to be maintained. And importantly, fish predictably aggregate in high densities around artificial reefs and increase the local productivity around those artificial reefs. And we've shown a lot of support that this actually can potentially feed back and enhance the productivity all the way up into the food web and into the fish community. And so the way that we've done this is we've done it by repeatedly, continually building more and more reefs under different circumstances and trying to understand how the environmental conditions change around the reef, but also trying to understand how these reefs exist under different environmental conditions. And so to date, we've built I forget the exact number, but it's, um, it's close. I think it's close to 50 reefs in the Bight of O'Robinson. Um, again, starting back in uh, 2009 was when we first built reefs. We've also conducted some experiments, artificial reef research in Haiti, specifically focusing on uh, the island of Ilavash uh, in the southern part of Haiti. And we've shown essentially, we now have evidence that this feedback dynamic really does exist. 
And we haven't exactly been able to quantify, there's, there's still a lot of really important science that needs to be done. And we can't exactly quantify if we build a reef here, it'll produce X number of fish. But we know that, you know, we feel confident enough that this feedback exists to the extent that we think we can move forward with thinking about scaling it up for conservation. So a really important question remains, how can we scale this, this uh, artificial reef research up to be used as a useful tool for conservation? And importantly, can we leverage this feedback dynamic that we, that we, hypo we previously hypothesized and now are generating increasing support for, can we leverage this to farm the coastline? So a key proposed mechanism for maintaining food security in the coastal, um, in coastal ecosystems has been to add more and more marine reserves. And um, as, as people well know, particularly in the Bahamas, there's been this, this push for the Caribbean challenge, uh, where by 2020, um, the goal was to have 20% of, the, of the, the coastal um, parts of the Caribbean uh, set aside as marine protected areas. And this was led by the UN and, the, and TNC. And, and so it, for a large part, I'm in favor for, um, of marine reserves, but I think we gotta be really careful about how we, um, about the fact that there are people that live and rely on the resources provided by these coastal ecosystems. So there's a lot of situations where it doesn't seem appropriate to just go in and say, okay, you all can't use this land or, or this, this, this coastal ecosystem because people really rely on these ecosystems. And this lesson was really, really um, stuck for me when um, I went down to Haiti originally with Craig Lane, we were brought down by the Nature Conservancy to help delineate the first marine national park in Haiti. And so based on our recommendations, they actually created a, a marine national park, which technically was a no, no fishing zone around the island of the Lavash. But in fact, if you, and in, and in fact, this, this park exists, you know, in, in the paper books um, through the government of Haiti. But if you actually go around to the people of the Lavash, A, they don't even know that this, that this um, reserve exists. And B, if they did, they wouldn't stop fishing because they need to. That's their livelihood. They exist on, on the resources provided by that marine environment. And so that got me thinking about alternative ways to think about how we can, how we can implement conservation plans, but not wholesale take away these fishing, these important fishing grounds for local communities. And so one way that I've been sort of promoting, particularly down in Haiti, but I've been working with these local communities, is that we can scale up the artificial reefs by building them in clusters. And then the idea would be that we could actually we could protect some of the clusters and not fish them. And that doesn't really take important you know, or vital fishing grounds away from anyone because this is just open seagrass and these areas are relatively small. And then we have, but then we also have other areas where we'd have clusters that would be actively fished. And the idea would be that there could be these, this, this um, spillover effect where the areas that are being protected could provide fish for these other areas that are being fished. And so instead of having something like this, where we have these large grounds where there's no fishing, we could think about it something more like this, where we actually have units throughout the region with small scale no-take areas that aren't really hindering fishing grounds, but we're also providing more potential habitat and, and enhanced productivity around that habitat that could help fuel local fisheries. So, there's a, there's a lot of science that needs to be done in order to sort of optimize the potential of this design. And one of the big questions that's remaining is, what is the optimal structure of these clusters of artificial reefs? And so we have, we have work that suggests that if we put the reefs in, in close proximity, as we see here on the left side, that could actually promote better fish habitat. And the idea is that the fish will use these reefs as shelter, and when they're closer together, that provides just a sort of a broader, better shelter from predation for these fish, both predation against, from larger fish, but also predation against, um, from humans. In contrast, on the far end, if we space these reefs out at greater distances, then we will actually be promoting that sort of synergistic effect that we get from 
enhanced fish nutrient uh, supply, which in turn can enhance primary production, which in turn can enhance potentially the invertebrate production within, that, within those areas, and, and ultimately fuel more fish production. And so this is sort of the basis of an NSF uh, project that has been recently funded that, that I'm, um, well, again, this is where I was supposedly gonna be in the Bahamas right now, because I'd be going to, um, to Eleuthera to look for, oh, that's funny, to look for, um, someone just popped up in their video. <laughs> um, oops, sorry. To look for potential sites to conduct this research. And so the idea is that we wanna, we wanna build these, um, we wanna test these environments under realistic scenarios whereby we work, we actively work with local communities to actively fish some of these reefs, some of these treatments, and then, or I guess fish these, and then actively protect against fishing on some of them. And again, this work, um, we're, we're gonna do it both in the Bahamas and in Haiti, um, but we're excited to um, collaborate with Nick Higgs and, part of, and, and the Cape Eleuthera Institute for this work. And, and this is one of the reasons why I'm excited about this talk, because this is a pretty, pretty large project. We, we haven't started it yet. Um, but we're hoping to, you know, reach out to both students and researchers within the Bahamas to collaborate with us on this work. There's lots of areas of potential collaboration, both in terms of doing the ecology, but also in terms of doing the social science work with the local communities, right? And so we're really excited about potential avenues of collaboration for this particular research. And this is something that's been really big, uh, really important for my work in the last, uh, I guess, five or six years and particularly working in, in Haiti where we've put a lot of time into working directly with these communities. It's not about just going and doing the ecology, but it's also about trying to help increase education and awareness about the ecology of these ecosystems. So we spend a lot of times, a lot of time going to, going to these fishing communities, meeting with the locals about our research, providing educational posters that you can walk around Ilavash today and you can see these posters hanging up throughout the schools. And we also work with the locals trying to actually engage them directly into the research. Every single reef that we built in Haiti has, has been fundamentally, uh, the only reason we've been able to do it is because of being able to work with these local fishers. And so they, not only do they get, um, do they work with us to build it, but they also gain ownership in these projects. And that's really important to us. And so we're trying to now extend these sort of, this sort of approach and bring that back to the Bahamas where we've been working for, for uh, so many years and try to engage local communities, local students and local researchers in this, in this effort. And so the goal here is the moving forward, we wanna, we wanna work with local communities, researchers and, and researchers to continue to explore the capacity of artificial reefs as a tool for coastal conservation. And with that, I, uh, I'll take any questions. And again, thanks a lot for, um, for listening in. And I gotta give a shout out to NSF and the David and Lucille Packer Foundation for funding support. I'll turn that volume on. Great, thank you, Jake, for a very interesting talk. Yeah. I'm sure there are many questions. And as Dr. Nair stated in the beginning, if anyone has questions, you can either um, opt to raise your hand, there's a raise hand button on Zoom and you can ask him yourself or you are welcome to type it out in the chat box. So we do have one question in the chat box from Heidi um, that states, how would the artificial reefs be secured in the case of natural disasters and how would they promote coral growth in the area? Uh, that's a great question. Um, let's see if I can find. Uh, so I just got uh, some photos back from a friend of mine um, Richard Apaldo, who has been critical in getting, allowing us to continue a lot of the work we've been doing uh, in, in the Bight of Old Robinson. And this is a, a reef that I built uh, in December of 2018. Um, and so this thing survived the largest hurricane in the history of the Atlantic, uh, basically unscathed. A few of the reefs that we built, they lost, some of these top blocks fell over, but this is a brand new reef. And you can see that there's a lot of fish biomass on that reef. So they seem to be doing pretty well um, in terms of surviving these hurricanes. And then um, in terms of the, the coral question, so this, this reef also has survived that, that uh, 
well, a series of hurricanes now, but this is an Acropora coral species right here that I transplanted. It was, it was sort of left over from the, one of the coral studies we did on, um, on the artificial, the smaller artificial reefs. And it's there, I have a picture from more recently, but it's doing really well. And I have a student that's gonna try to survey some of these reefs to figure out, so how coral are growing on them, sort of how they're, they're colonizing to them and how they're growing. But you can see in, in many of these sites that they, there's, there's lots of coral. You can definitely see the plates, the coral plates of the juveniles um, growing out. Um, so it seems to be pretty good, but obviously coral are kind of under stress right now. So uh, there's, I guess there's yet to, there's, a lot, there's, there's a plenty of opportunity for research in that area, that's for sure. Okay, and did you also address how, um, how they'd be secured during natural disasters? Well, yeah, yeah, I guess I, what I was trying to say is that, I mean, they, these are all the reefs are all glued together. And I mean, this thing survived a hurricane without any problem whatsoever. That was the sort of point of going to of the other, the other image. They, they seem to be weathering the hurricanes pretty well. We've, we've had some trial and error with how to glue them and the best glue to use. And, and we've lost some reefs, but I'd say the vast majority of what we've built has, uh, has done pretty well. Uh, in the hurricanes, especially when you have high quality block. It's, this is block that we just get in the Bahamas and it's, it's really good. And so that, that stays, stays together perfectly, in, even in these massive hurricanes. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat box from Mr. Andrew. How often should these artificial reefs be monitored and what protective measures would you recommend to mitigate against fishing on protected artificial reefs? Um, I mean, the monitoring question, it's a good one. And I guess it's really all about what's the scientific question. I mean, on some capacity, they, you could simply just put them out and let them be. Um, but we try to monitor them you know, yearly or biannually to try to figure out sort of how we're getting changed in the fish community. What something where my lab is particularly interested in right now is like how the design of the reef may change the different fish community that the reef gets. And so that would require high level monitoring. Um, and as for the protecting against fishing, again, that sort of depends on, on what the goal is. I think, for example, the work we're doing in Haiti, I, I don't have any, I mean, I'm, the way I look at it, it's their, their, their reefs and they can fish them as much as they want. What, what I'm finding is that even if they do get high level of fishing pressure, these fish, uh, the reefs still hold quite a few fish. They're pretty hard to fish. And at least in the Bahamas, there's not a whole lot of desire for a lot of the, a lot of the fish that we'll see on them. But um, it's really all about the goal. If you're trying to protect them from fishing, I think that the best way to do it is to engage the local community and have full buy-in with those community members. And that's the, been our approach in Haiti. We, the, when I was there last, which was unfortunately over a year ago, um, I had a meeting with local communities and there was full support for if I built, if we built two clusters of reefs, that they wouldn't fish one of those clusters. But the idea could be that over time we would maybe switch and they could fish the one that we hadn't fished for a while. But again, that's sort of, to me, the, the most important part is that you got to have the community buy-in for those, um, for any kind of protection action against fishing. And so I think that engaging the community in that sense would be the key way to go there. Okay, great. We have a comment from Giselle Dean from the Bahamas National Trust. And great work, very great presentation, very interesting work. Would be great to see this alongside the ongoing conch ranching work being done to contribute to sustainable fisheries. I was wondering if you have done any work with conch. Uh, I've measured their pee. <laughs> um, they and they don't actually pee, which is was really difficult to figure out why. Um, but I, I haven't done much with conch. I'm I am in support of any potential conservation efforts to get conch, uh, to improve the sustainability of conch. It's obviously a critically important staple to the, the you know, the, the livelihood and culture of the Bahamas. And so, yeah, I think that could be a really interesting idea. They definitely have, they're, they're all over the, the seagrass around these reefs, that's for sure. I mean, it's really uh, highly nutritious. There's lots of epiphyte that the conch will feed on. So you do see quite a few conch around around these reefs. So that could be a, it could be a useful tool. I'd, I'd be happy to speak more uh, with her about that for sure. Please reach out to me, yeah, shoot me an email. 
Okay. Um, I'll take another question from the chat, and then I see that we have one person who's raising your hand. Um, Wendy, sorry, this scrolled down. Okay, Wendy Seymour had asked, will this glue used harm the inhabitants over an extended period of time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I, my, I don't know the answer. I, I haven't done the chemical test on it, but, but the work, what we're using now is inert in theory. It, it's claimed to be inert. Um, it's, we use Z-SPAR and it, it's, it hardens to the extent that it's, I mean, it, you can sand it essentially. Um, so it, we've done, I've done, I've looked up and I've communicated with people there that it is supposedly inert. I, we don't use very much of it. It doesn't actually take very much glue. I think it's a really valid question. I, I'm not, it's not something that I'm concerned with. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, it, the answer is no, it won't. Um, but, um, uh, you know, in order to really, for me to justify that statement, honestly, I'd have, we'd have to do really extensive studies with it. It's something that I don't think is a major threat. Um, to the local ecosystem, but I do think it's a very good question and I do actually I think it's pretty fair to say if you just look at this image here and the fact that coral grow on it coral is so sensitive to to toxins and pollutants that you know that does speak to the fact that it's not I mean these are sort of biogenic habitats now this tons of stuff grows on these reefs and so that does sort of speak to the fact that it's unlikely and it's also important to note that these reefs, the cinder blocks we use are essentially old coral reefs because they're mined from the local habitat or the local, um, you know, they're made in the Bahamas or they're made in Haiti. And that's, that's limestone and limestone is old coral reef. And so they're really good habitat for, for coral to, to, to grow on and also to attract fish for that reason. Okay. We have a few more questions in the chat, but I'm going to call on Indira Brown, who's um, raising her hand, so she will ask her question. Oops, if I can get this. Good morning, everyone. I'm Indira yeah. Brown from the Department of Marine Resources. Can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, my question is, you indicated earlier that the artificial reef um, fish population is not really targeted by local fishers in the Bahamas. Um, can you indicate the difference of um, targeted species, which we will find on these artificial reef versus the natural reef system? Can I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you clarify that? Can I do what, I'm sorry? Um, can't you distinguish the different types of species, targeted fish species that local fishers target in the Bahamas, which will be found on these artificial reef versus the natural reef systems? Yeah, sure. Uh, and yeah, and I, 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 I probably sort of overspoke there. I mostly was referring to the fact that the, of the size. I mean, a lot of the places um, in, in the Bahamas, as we all know, there, there's still some healthy fish. And so this reef has decent sized snapper on it that people would, would certainly want to feed on, but we do get a lot of juveniles on these reefs. So Nassau grouper would be a perfect uh, example. These reefs often have many uh, I mean, it's many being a handful, a uh, couple, a uh, couple, three Nassau, Nassau grouper on them, but they're typically smaller. They're, low, they're smaller than the limit we could we can legally harvest anyhow. And so that's they're important in that sense, important sort of stepping ground for the grouper to move out. But beyond that, I mean, the there are there's certainly lots of snapper, and as you can see from this image, I mean, there's 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 pan fryers for sure here. I was kind of more speaking about um, sort of commercially, uh, commercially speaking. And, and so in that sense, uh, they, I would say these reefs provide sort of juvenile, um, juvenile habitat for many of the, of the commercial species of grouper and uh, species like that that will ultimately move out towards the larger reef. Did, did that address your question? I think she's. Um, I also. Muted. Sorry, can you repeat, Ms. Brown, because you were muted. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes sir. Oh, yes, you did answer my question. The other question I also had was um, based on um, the increase of seagrass population, which you have, uh, have observed. Have you also um, observed increase in um, 
cream comes settling around those seagrass. I know you said you you are limited. Um, you have limited research on crane conch, but based on just simple observation, have you seen any increase in conch population as well around those seagrass beds? Um, it, it is it's hard to say. And anecdotally, I, I don't I don't know. Um, it's very common to see conch around the reef. I'll put it that way. Um, how much more common it is to see around the reef relative to an open seagrass bed. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I feel super comfortable saying that, but um, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly good habitat for conch, conch like the sort of thick luscious seagrass that we, that we see around these reefs and um, you do frequently see conch around them. So it's, um, but it's not, I haven't noticed uh, any, any particular sort of, um, overabundance of them in that sense. Okay, thank you. We have a handful more questions. Jake, do you still have a few minutes to answer these? We have a lot of interest in your talk. So. Yeah, sure. I'm in no hurry. I'm happy to, I'm happy to chat for however long. Okay. As long as we can keep this uh, window open, then we'll I'll continue asking questions. Um, I have a question from Jude Adderley that says, if these artificial reefs are created, do you think they will have a similar effect like the large farms near the Michigan River? Would there be dense nutrient spots? Um, similar effect is what? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not following that. But that was a written question, huh? It was a written question, yes. So I guess, are they saying like, a, in terms of like a nutrient, a negative effect of a nutrient plume? Uh, mm -hmm. I, Possibly, it says, would there be dense nutrient spots? So would these create? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say the answer would be no, uh, because again, these systems are so nutrient poor, and I mean, you can see how 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 clear the water is that um, there. You know, these fish aren't creating that much nutrients. You'd have to have a whole scale ecosystem press of nutrients um, to really change it into a sort of a eutrophied system. And we don't, the biomass of fish just isn't anywhere near that. I mean, you literally, I could go and swim in the middle of that, you know, the mess of fish that you see here on this reef. And I would be surprised if I could actually even detect the change in the nutrients in the water column versus, you know, 20 meters away, because it's just taken up so fast in the environment. So I, I, if, if that was the question, then I would say absolutely not. It doesn't, it's not a concern. Most of that's just taken up immediately by primary producers. Okay. Um, Good question have, though. We have a question from, I think this is Mr. Gittins. There's research that shows that seagrass can alter ocean chemistry, including pH in a manner that may guard against ocean acidification. Are you able to expand your re research to monitor changes in pH in your artificial reefs in order to explore the possibility of manipulating pH using artificial reefs? Uh, that's a cool question. Um, the scale that we are operating on, I would be surprised if we're getting uh, changes in pH uh, locally, but um, we are doing, a student of mine is working on thinking about how the seagrass um, is storing carbon, and sequestering carbon. So in thinking about that respect to climate change, seagrass beds are some of the most, um, per unit area, they sequester more carbon than any ecosystem type in, on the planet. Uh, like. 10 times more than tropical rainforest, even though it's sort of maybe hard to believe. Um, and so that's something we are really interested in. What are these sort of uh, alternative implications of not only just associated with the artificial reef, but in terms of just conservation of seagrass habitats um, for these like, larger changes that we're seeing in terms of climate change action. Um, I think that the pH uh, question would be something that you would probably see on a larger sort of ecosystem scale. And so maybe if you, um, like through a, a sort of restoration event where all of a sudden you get the whole system was restored back to, to seagrass, you might see that the whole system being like somewhere the size of the bite of old Robinson. Um, but I, I don't know if we would see a pH um, change around the reefs, but it is a really good point. And we are monitoring, we're getting into some of the biogeochemistry uh, more detailed uh, around the reefs. And, and I think that's a super important point. In, in, um, it's, it'll be interesting to see what we generate, but they're, they're definitely storing a lot of carbon, that's for sure, which is really cool. It's a really, and it's something that I've, I've, I promote, and I think that as the Bahamas, given how much seagrass beds are in the Bahamas, 
it's something that, that we should continue to look into as a, as a really important ecosystem service that the country is providing the world, essentially. And so I think that's a really big deal and something that we shouldn't underestimate sort of as a, as a scientific community and as a, as a country. Okay, we have another question from Heidi that says, what element of artificial reefs attracts them, uh, 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 sorry, attracts fish to them and allow for permanent residence there? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, we don't, it's a great question. And I mean, the, the main thing I can say is that it's just structure. Uh, I think it's really important that they are, they are made of that limestone that, that has that, it likely has essentially that smell that they would be used to because it's, it is, like I said, it's, it, it is quite literally old coral reef. Um, I think using tires and having the same structure, you wouldn't get the same effect, right? If you built this thing out of rubber, I don't think you'd get the same density of fish as you see. So I think it's a combination of the structure plus the, um, the material, but, but we've been trying to manipulate the, the structure by adding things that go up into the air. Or, um, we've had, you know, when I added those, um, the trees to put the coral on, on the reefs that changed all of a sudden, we started getting a lot more juveniles. And so that's a question that, that we're interested in our lab in pursuing and trying to build reefs of different sort of shapes and structures and sizes to see how that may bring in different species. And it, it could be important to um, the question that Ms. Brown brought up, because we could maybe then design reefs to more explicitly target fish, fish species that are, are of commercial interest. So maybe we need to have larger holes. This reef here has, has a couple holes in it here and here that I kind of build into the design. Well, maybe they need to be bigger or more convoluted and we can get larger you know, black grouper or whatever, you know, deer grouper or something like that to aggregate on these reefs. So it's a really interesting question, something that, that we need to do a lot more work with, but I've kind of been sticking with a similar design because we're trying to keep replication throughout the places that we're working. Okay, we ha next have um, first a comment and then some questions from Paul Malis. His comment is, thank you for the presentation. As a fisherman, you confirm a lot of observations about the abundance of fish on a coral head reef and the vibrancy of the coral. You're partnered with a wise and connected person in Nick Higgs. He hails from a fishing community that had used artificial reefs for decades. I look cool. forward to a deeper investigation of this research. I appreciate Absolutely. your thoughtful approach to the involvement of the fishing community. Great. And then his question, is there a particular type of coral you have identified that seems to need the fish nutrients the most? And the same question applies to seagrass. Um, so we'll start with the coral. So first of all, thanks for that comment. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really excited about um, working with Nick moving forward. It's, I think it could be a, it's got some really great promise. Um, and likewise with, with UB. Um, but uh, in terms of coral, I don't really know, to be honest. We, we measured, we did two species. And I kind of, I didn't, I kind of glossed over that, the details of that, the finding. I've only done one real study with the coral. Um, and we did, we used two species. Uh, the Acropora, it was a, we used Acropora palmata and Parides parietes, and the Acropora grew like gangbusters. I had a, a colleague of mine that's a coral physiologist was on it, and he was just blown away by how fast it grew uh, under the conditions of, of sort of high levels of fish nutrients. Um, but I don't, uh, beyond that, I'm not totally aware of it. There have been a, a handful of other studies and other systems that have looked at that, but I don't, I don't know uh, much detail about that. Um, and in terms of the seagrass, I mean, the last year, there's only really three main species of seagrass within the system, and um, the thalassia seems to just do, just grow like gangbusters too. It just, it, it does really well. You do see some syringodium uh, increase in densities around some of the reefs, but not all of them. Uh, when you don't have uh, fertilizer, anytime you have fertilizer, you see the syringodium go crazy, but you do still see just enhanced nutrients in general does seem to give syringodium a little bit of a competitive advantage, but, but you still get a lot of thalassia. Um, and then we haven't yet seen any halidule come in at all, which, which you would expect if the system was really getting blasted with nutrients, um, particularly from things like sewage, that it, it might shift into the halidule, which is the third species. Okay, we have a question from J.A. Johnson saying, have you reached out to the Dominican Republic concerning this methodology? Uh, nope, I haven't. Um, we, you know, there's, 
there's a uh, just limited capacity uh, in terms of what we can do. And, and uh, I, I really love working in Haiti and I really love working in the Bahamas. The DR was a site that we were looking to do some research for a while, but I, I, I got overwhelmed with all the potential in, in, in Haiti and, and the Bahamas and some kind of personally um, focusing on those areas. I, I think that there's potential for this in a lot of places. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to certainly discuss uh, discuss that with anyone moving forward, but definitely kind of trying to stay focused and, and, and really learn, um, learn how, how we can use as a tool in these systems before we kind of expand out. There's still a lot of, there's still a lot of science needs to be done. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to spread too thin essentially, but it's a great question. So and the DR would be an awesome place to work for sure. Okay. There's next a question from Daniel Mon Montgomery, how does fish community composition on artificial reefs compare with communities on natural reefs? Do you think communities on artificial reefs will be resilient to environmental disturbance? Uh, that's a great question. And again, something we're, we're working on, I would say they differ most fundamentally in that you just don't have those coral obligate species. Um, we do see like a lot of zooplankton species uh, on or I guess I would say a lot, but a handful of species. But on artificial reefs, the, the, the communities are generally less diverse. Um, it's kind of weird. We start seeing the, so we have a paper, Lauren Yeager led a study and showed that after 120 days, the community stabilizes. I've actually found that it takes a little bit longer. It kind of does a, a dip again. And after, it's really after a couple of years, we really see it stabilize. And even that, I think it's actually the size of the reef. So for our smaller reefs, it seems like it stabilizes into one of two different types of communities. Either one would be dominated um, almost entirely by squirrel fish with, you know, snapper and, and Nassau grouper kind of peppered in. And the other one would be uh, more and more dominated by grunts. But then on these larger reefs, as you can see in this image, um, this is really dominated by gray snapper and these white grunts. And so we're starting to see that with some of the bigger reefs that the gray snapper kind of take over and they become the dominant species. So in general, I think the species diversity is lower. Um, if I, I do think on some level they could be more resilient in the sense that you just don't have those species that have the, they, they have to have coral. And I mean, as, as many of you all probably know, gray snapper and grunts are really tough, hardy species. So they can kind of deal with a lot of, a lot of stressors. So. And it may be one of those kind of interesting things where lower diversity actually might be slightly more resilient, but uh, I don't, we don't know that yet. Uh, it's a great question and something we're definitely looking into pursuing further. Great. We have another question from Paul Malis to ask if you've investigated the extensive artificial reefs in the Western Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I have not. I've read um, in uh, Western Gulf of Mexico. Uh, no, I have not. I've read about it. I've, I've reviewed a handful of papers about it. Um, those and also some of those off the coast of, off the Atlantic coast of the uh, southeastern U.S. Um, but I have not. I, it's, I think it's, it's fascinating. We, uh, Craig and I, or Craig Lane and I are uh, writing a review paper where we're thinking about other systems, but um, I don't know much about that one. I'll look into it though. Thanks for the, thanks for the heads up on it. Okay, we have another question from Mr. Gittins. There's an urgent need to explore what makes corals susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease. Are you able to utilize the data that you currently have to quickly determine whether there's a correlation between the occurrence of any diseases and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios? Uh, I, find that I totally agree with that, that statement and, and the answer is unfortunately no, I, I can't. Um, I, I do think that um, these reefs being platforms to test, quickly test um, coral attributes about coral physiology are, is really awesome. Especially these bigger ones where we can actually just, we can just glue them directly onto it essentially. Um, but, but no, we don't have any, any data like that. We actually had very little um, death uh, or even tissue um, sort of lesions on, I think it was eight, eight total individuals out of a hundred and, I don't even remember the number now, 130 something. Um, so we didn't, we didn't see a whole lot. I mean, they seem to do really well across the board, especially under the sort of nutrient environment with the fish. But, um, so no, unfortunately not. 
Okay, we have another, we have just a couple, two more questions here. Um, this next one is from Michael Bolick. He says, really interesting talk. Thank you for this. I'm assuming a significant amount of your monitoring protocols looks at fin fish populations on these artificial reefs. Have you looked into any capacity Caribbean spiny lobster populations on these artificial reefs and the role they play in these artificial areas? Uh, so we, mo we do monitor um, the lobster for sure. And the lobster love these things. Uh, they're, they're, it's really cool to see how many uh, lobsters some of these reefs have. It's, it's which reef has a lot is, uh, it's not always clear why they're there, but I, I think Craig counted 69 lobster on a reef with 40 cinder blocks once. I mean, it's, the numbers could be just nuts. And we have some reefs over in Andros that have, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, of lobster on them. So, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of potential for thinking about um, how this, this idea can interact with the sort of lobster fishery and then thinking about seagrass productivity. That's something I've talked a lot about with, um, with Nick Higgs as well. Um, there's a lot there. I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything concrete yet, but I'm, I'm really excited about that avenue because obviously the crawfish uh, fishery in the Bahamas is really critical. And I think that there's, uh, it's a really important, and I think there's a lot of potential for keeping it as a really sustainable um, source of, of food and income uh, for the region. So I think there could be, uh, I think there is a lot of really um, potentially really interesting overlap with the stuff that we've been doing with artificial reefs. In terms of lobster provide a lot of nutrients. I mean, they, I, we, I have measured their pee as well. And um, they, you know, they, they excrete a bunch of nutrients and so that matters right and so when you have high densities then they they, they elicit this feedback as well and they're they're you know high in biomass so um i think that they are really important component of this and we do have history every survey i've ever done i always count the lobster i don't count a lot of the smaller invertebrates but certainly lobster and any of the larger crabs it's a great great comment question You still there? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was. I might have been on mute. Did you hear that question? Uh, I didn't. No. no. Okay. Sorry. I have. I said I had two more questions, and then we're going to close the question period after that. So the next one is from Dr. Amina Mosk. And it asks, do you have any data or have you published any research concerning nutrient contents within Bahamian waters? Uh, nutrient content of the actual water? Do you know? Um, not sure. It says okay. um, nutrient well, content within Bahamian waters, so I assume the water. Yeah, I mean, so yes, I have a bunch of data on that and I have published uh, quite a few papers on that. Um, the, it's not, that sort of was sort of the, the baseline work for my PhD was just to try to quantify sort of nutrient availability and nutrient limitation uh, in these, in the Bahamian coastal ecosystems. And we actually did a study that showed that the, uh, you, I think you can take it with a grain of salt, but it, it, it compared the Bahamian waters with um, other, uh, basically a lot of ecosystems throughout the world and showed that it was among the, um, most nutrient limited systems that have been studied. So really nutrient poor. Uh, and then the fact that they're so nutrient poor that the water column isn't a very good indicator of nutrients. It, it, certainly if you're in a, in a bay where you get a bunch of sewage input, then you'll see a signal, but it's really hard to detect any kind of minor changes in water column nutrients. And so that's why we actually use seagrass nutrient content. It's a really good indicator of sort of longer term signals of nutrients. And so like around the reefs, we'll see the seagrass has a higher percent nitrogen and percent phosphorus than it does in the sort of open water. But yeah, we've got a ton of, uh, of information on that, if, uh, by a ton. I mean, been studying it for quite some time, I should say. Um, but I'm happy to send some papers if, if she wants to reach out to me by email. I can, I can, I can shoot her some papers or, or, or build on that conversation. Okay, great. And this last question is again from Mr. Gittins. Have you seen any lobster larvae settle on the seagrass induced by your reefs? So 
That is, uh, the answer is no, and it sort of breaks my heart. I've really never seen, I think I've seen one lobster larvae in my whole life. And I don't know why, <laughs> because the lobster are everywhere and I stick my head in seagrass all the time. So no, I haven't. Um, I think the only time I've seen them, I can't remember where, but I think it was way in the back of the bite, um, sort of in like the Laurentia patches where you kind of expect them to settle out. But um, we don't get a lot of that. So they, they're, they're supposedly they cue in on the Laurentia patches and we don't get a whole lot of those patches in this sort of more open seagrass. But um, no, I haven't. It's, a, it's sort of, I don't know if they're there. I just miss them or, I mean, they seem like they kind of have to be there, but um, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen any really ever. So <laughs> but it's a great question. Okay, thank you, Jake, for answering all those questions. We had quite a few. There's a lot of interest in your talk. Um, do you mind providing information on your website if people are interested in finding out more information about your research, where they can find that? Yeah, sure. I've got a website. It's just jacobalgeyer.com. Um, and I mean, I think you could just write like Jake Allgaier Fish Pea and you'll get information comes up. <laughs> but yeah, and again, I'm at University of Michigan. So it's, it's and there's a link to my website um, through that. And it's got, uh, by publications and um, work that we're we're doing, and and if anybody wants to reach out to me directly, um, my email I, is it on that was it on that flyer, Kristen? Um, I don't believe so, but I could be mistaken. I don't remember off the top of my head. Well, it's it's J E A L L G at umich dot edu, but again, it's not it's not very hard to find. It, Michigan has a good website, um, and just reach out. Feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have any questions or comments or you want access to some of the some of the work we've done i'd be more than happy to talk with y'all and um again i really appreciate this opportunity it's a bummer that it could be in person but uh you know we will make do and um i'll be down there the minute that i can that's for sure uh, scoping out sites and getting some of this this research underway and and uh we hope to be doing some collaboration with with you all moving forward it's it's a really exciting opportunity great well, Jake, I didn't have a chance to read off all of the positive comments in the chat box, but there were a lot more that I didn't get to read. So hopefully you get a chance to go back and read through those. But there was a lot of um, positive feedback from everyone who participated today and a lot of questions. So definitely Great. an interesting and informative talk. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Small Island Sustainability Program at UB. Thank awesome. you for your time today and for um, changing plans since we weren't able to do this in person. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Vic Nair from the Office of Graduate Studies and Research for organizing the logistics of this talk and to everyone who participated today. I was really happy to see such a, a large group turn out to this. So thank you very much. And I'll pass the mic back over to, see, to Dr. Watson or Dr. Nair if they have any final closing comments. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for moderating the session today. Excellent session. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elgoy for a wonderful session today. Um, Absolutely, thank you. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether if Dr. Watson has any closing, uh, any closing address that he wants to make before we end the session. Dr. Well, Watson. I, I would just like to say thanks again um, to Jake um, for, for participating and doing this um, presentation. And I think from the response, it is clear that everyone finds the work very um, interesting and, innovation, and innovative and um, it is good to see both students and professionals um, alike, as well as uh, fishermen, local fishermen um, on this talk. Um, it shows the broad interest. It's not just an academic, and that's the important thing what, why I really love it. It's not just an academic piece of work that you engaged in. Absolutely. And that's what we aspire to do at the, at, the, at the SIS, that we are engaging with communities to really impact um, the, uh, the economy, local economies, to make them more sustainable, resilient. And we think that this, we know the importance of our waters and our fisheries to the Bahamas. And so this work is extremely important. And from the university side, we look forward to, as we build our graduate programs um, in marine science, which is a key priority, we look forward to engaging you um, in this work and to be able to partner and to um, also with Katie Luthra, so I'm glad to see Nick here as well. We, we constantly um, reach out and work um, together. So this is an excellent opportunity for all of us to work together to advance fisheries 
for the sake of our local communities and for conservation. So thanks again. And we look forward to um, speaking with you and seeing you in person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all hosting me. And absolutely, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all about the, the collective action with everybody, right? So it's, it's awesome. I'm, I'm really glad to, to get that going with you all. It'll be, it'll be awesome. It'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. So thank you once again for all those who have uh, taken your time to, to, to get to listen to this uh, session today. Uh, as I've said, the session is recorded. So those of you who really want uh, the recording, you can write to me at, at research at ub.edu.bs and we can send you the link to the recording. So stay safe, stay indoors. Please remember all the, the orders from the government. So we got to stay safe. Uh, so we are still connected. So stay in touch. And we hope to see you again uh, in the next uh, research uh, presentation session. Thanks. Thank you once again, uh, uh, Dr. Algoya. So we will stay in touch to see how Absolutely. we can further collaborate. Thank right. you all. Thanks so much. Bye. I appreciate it. Y'all take care. Take care then. Bye.